Right, thank you again. So, um, okay. so we stopped at uh, uh, last yesterday. I think we've constructed for a Lie algebra. Um, Uh, we constructed uh, a surjection, uh, the, Ch the Chevalier map, uh, to the Lie algebra of the um, uh, of a Cartan, uh, to a Cartan subalgebra of mod W. And so remember, this was all over an algebraic closure of our local field. But actually, uh, the map is defined over F. Uh, but I would like to say a little bit about what it might look like over what the image looks like over the non-algebraically closed field. So the instructive picture, by the way, a lot of, uh, so everything that so far that I did not copy from um, Ali Altug's lectures, uh, I have copied from um, the uh, article on harmonic analysis uh, by Kotwitz in the clay volume from 2004. So, uh, and, and now the next picture comes from the article by de Becker in the same volume. So um, kind of an instructive picture to keep in mind <clears throat> is uh, what happens for, uh, so here let's take G equals SL2R. So, uh, and uh, so for SL2, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, we discussed that uh, the the map is given by coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, but of course trace is zero, so the only meaningful coefficient is actually the determinant, right? So I'm going to write it as, uh, so let's write an element x in GL2 as x negative x, y, z, right? So this is in, oh, sorry, in SL2R. I'm trying to do this math frac letters which is not working so well for uh, for the Lie algebra. So uh, uh, we can do a small change co of coordinates. Let's actually write it as x negative x, y plus z, y minus z. So just kind of a rotation in the y, z coordinates. I don't care about the half. <clears throat> So just because then, then, then this picture will be very well motivated, right? So now our Chevalier map is given by uh, just the determinant of this. Um, which is equal to um, negative x squared minus something like y, y squared minus z squared, right? And so this is z squared minus x squared plus y squared. All right, so, so then it means that what does a fiber over an arbitrary point look like? Well, the fiber over zero then is a cone, and that's what I'm drawing, right? And uh, if you have a point that's um, and kind of outside the cone, you will get uh, one sheeted hyperboloids. And uh, if you, and the orbits inside the cone looks like two sheeted hyperboloids. Okay, and so this is where, now imagine, I mean, okay, the picture is over R just so that we can get a clear picture. Of course, over a non-Archimedean local field, the same thing happens. The matter is just whether some uh, point that we're mapping to is a square versus a non-square, right? So I'll, I'll write this down in a moment. But uh, kind of the thing to appreciate here <clears throat> is also kind of an illustration to what Tasha was talking about yesterday. Um, uh, so, uh, well, what we discussed last time is <clears throat> The, uh, this picture is for, well, Tasha was talking about the group, we're talking about the Lie algebra, but it's roughly this, kind of the same idea, the same, approximately the same things happen. So we're talking about the adjoint orbit in the group, and so um, the fibers of this map are orbits over the algebraic closure of the field, right? So these are stable orbits. And uh, what I'm trying to say, which is not going to be important for my lectures, but kind of fits well with everything else, is that, um, if you care about G of F orbits, then in the cases where you get a two-sheeted hyperboloid, uh, each half is a single G of F orbit, and uh, the 
and you can conjugate one uh, a point from this half to a point from another half if you allow either GL2 or points from the algebraic closure or just from the quadratic extension. So this is really an illustration of a stable orbit breaking into two uh, rational orbits. And we see that it doesn't always break. It depends, right? When you have a one-sheeted hyperboloid, meaning you talk about hyperbolic elements, right? Then uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, the stable orbit is the same as the rational orbit. And uh, yeah, and so what's the inverse image? Uh, so, so the nilpotent cone, um, so C inverse of zero is the nilpotent cone. And in this situation, the top half and the bottom half are going to be a single rational orbits. You see that they're not closed, and their closure contains the origin, which is the orbit of the of the origin. So this, all the nilpotent elements are stratified into this. So this is this is the standard picture, which uh, yeah, I guess most people here know. But if you don't, then it's kind of handy to keep in mind. <clears throat> All right, and so now, uh, yeah, so, so uh, what's important for me here is that, um, so, um, so over our non-algebraically closed field, um, So what we should do is be a little bit more careful. So you can, uh, so well, I'm assuming the G is split, right? So we pick a split maximal torus. And so we use this T, you use this split maximal torus. Um, maybe I'll call it T star, OK? Uh, just, just, or maybe T split, sorry. Just to distinguish it from random torus that we might have to deal with later. So we use T split to form our space. I don't think I introduced this notation, so I copied this notation from Kotwitz, I really like it. So to, so this this AG, which is uh, T mod W. So we're taking the split one. <clears throat> and so then everything works, the map is defined. But then you see, so over the algebraic closure, I mean, clearly the map was surjective, right? But here, what we, what we have is, uh, well, I mean, it is surjective, but the image breaks down into a disjoint union of images of different tori, right? So, uh, so also recall from Tasha's talks, uh, The tori in, uh, I mean, you can, you can deal with your favorite example here, GL2 or SL2 is going to be very little difference. So let's say tori in GL2 correspond to quadratic extensions. Well, I should say degree two algebras, then it would include the split torus as well. <laughs> So maybe it could be split, so it could be, so this is not a good way to say it, but I want to say that it could be E is direct sum of two copies of F. <clears throat> and so then uh, the, uh, so this, uh, so our space, A G of F up to, a set of uh, positive codimension. So in this situation, the positive codimension will just be the origin, uh, which is not an image of a semi-simple element. But the images of a sample of semi-simple elements are dense in there, uh, and uh, they, they make up a disjoint union. of uh, images of, uh, I would say, conjugacy classes of uh, tori. So I would say of, uh, mm, so, oh, sorry, tori up to G, uh, tori in GL2 up to conjugacy here, F conjugacy. So uh, images of, uh, well, let's say representatives of conjugacy classes. of tori in the sense that, well, so uh, in our example, so at the moment I've switched to GL2, right? So uh, we have a situation, so remember uh, an element <coughs> x maps to trace x determinant x. <coughs> and so, uh, 
so if this is a point, well, let's call it some, maybe let's call this point A, B, right? And so, well, uh, so you look at the characteristic polynomial and so you get the discriminant. So, so if um, A squared, Minus four b, right? So you, you you look at the discriminant, and uh, if it is a square, then our point is in the image of the split torus. And if it is a non-square, then we look at the extension generated by the square root. of the torus that corresponds to uh, f uh, adjoined the square root of the discriminant. <coughs> and so this will come up soon as, as we're dealing with various measures that we will have on our tori and on, on orbits. And that's why I'm doing it in so much detail. Is this good so far? Any questions? So this should be completely elementary. If not, ask a question, please. Sorry? Oh, yeah, the bottom of the set of positive co-dimensions. So I'm trying to say that <clears throat> my AG of F um, is uh, the image of the whole the algebra, right? And so, for example, here the nilpotent cone hangs over zero. So, uh, and now I'm just, the rest, um, I, I actually re really only care for the image of the semi-simple elements. And I'm saying that the semi-simple elements are dense, and the image of the semi-simple elements is dense in AG. Right, so here everything, so in this one dimensional example, so this is my, so for SL2, AG is just going to be A1, right? uh, so, so this G here is SL2. Um, and so the, the set of positive co-dimensions that I have to throw away is just the origin uh, over which the nilpotent cone hangs. Generally, you have to throw away some, hyper, not quite, uh, roughly speaking, hyperplane sort of. Sorry? Yeah, it's smaller dimension. So positive co-dimension, right? This is right. Yeah, so I'm throwing away, uh, I'm just throwing away a set of obvious measure zero in all, in all centers. Okay. No? Is it? No. Oh, yeah, I guess zero, zero. Oh, yeah, zero is semi-simple. So maybe I don't, anyway, I don't want to think about this. <laughs> no, I just want to think about the image of the semi-simple elements and break it into a disjoint union of images of tori up to conjugacy. That's, so my point, the point of all of this was that actually by looking at the point downstairs, you can tell uh, what kind of torus it comes from, which extension it corresponds to just by looking at uh, the discriminant of the polynomial. <laughs> Okay, so now, uh, so this was very well for the Lie algebra, now for the group. So remember, the, so, so far all I've done is described the stable orbits in the Lie algebra, but I want uh, stable conjugacy classes, stable orbits in the, in the group itself. So this is where we start making assumptions. So of course I'm going to be assuming that G is split over F. But uh, by the way, uh, um, I'm trying to do exposition of Frank and Langlands and Go, and they're not assuming that. So it's just, you know, it would not fit into any reasonable number of lectures if I were to try to do that. Uh, and so I have to assume split. Uh, also, so now, so the real assumption that we will be working with later would be that uh, the derived subgroup is simply connected. I will explain. Uh, why this uh, why this is a reasonable uh, assumption that we would kind of need and again uh, so then my understanding of what happens if it's not simply connected is actually quite shaky so my impression is that many things change so first of all the steinberg hitchin bases we're about to define will not be uh, anything like an affine space, uh, but also, as Tasha pointed out yesterday, so the matter of stable conjugacy versus GOF bar conjugacy is not that simple. And so I think, basically, as it goes, one basically tries to find a way, you know, use Z extension or something to, to reduce everything to the case when G derived is simply connected. And I think uh, FLN also do the same thing. I think they somehow do something to, to reduce to the case of uh, simply connected G derived, and I don't exactly know how it works. So um, anyhow, so I can explain at least why, why we care for that. And so just for right now, 
uh, I'll, it will become clear when the right now ends. Uh, assume actually that G is semi-simple. Okay, so if I have a semi-simple, and so then G is uh, the same as its derived subgroup. Uh, so uh, I have a semi-simple, simply connected group. That's the easiest possible situation to have. So then basically uh, the situation of the quotient would be, of this uh, Chevalet quotient, it would be called the Steinberg quotient, but it would be exactly the same as for the Lie algebra. Mm -hmm. So let's explain why. So first, uh, a very quick reminder of what semi-simple means. Uh, just, just in case. So, uh, our G, because it's split, corresponds to its root datum, uh, which is just a quadruple because it's split. So it's, uh, so yeah, we have T split maximal torus. So, uh, so then I have character, uh, character lattice roots, uh, co-characters and co-roots, which you've seen a lot already. So, uh, so remember, um, well, we also, so we can form the root lattice, which technically speaking lives in, in this real vector space. Morally speaking, you can try to think of it as if it was living in the dual of the uh, Lie algebra of T, but I mean, that's over a wrong field. Anyway, so you have the root lattice. Uh, so this is uh, the lattice spanned by the roots. <clears throat> And dually, you have the weight lattice, right, which is the dual. So it's uh, the set of mu uh, such that this pairing, uh, remember the angle brackets pairing is this two, uh, this thing. Uh, so that this is an integer. So this is something that uh, kind of, the, uh, that's the thing that kind of comes from the Lie algebra, right? It just comes from the root system. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we have that the weight lattice always contains the character lattice of the torus, and it contains the root lattice. And where this lattice sits determines the isogenic class of our group. So this determines, and so the G, so the definition <laughs> is that G is simply connected. So right now, remember, I'm talking about a semi-simple group. Uh, just as a reminder, so that I'm not lying. Uh, if um, so, this is this is this really can be thought of as a definition. If uh, the weight lattice is the character lattice of the torus, so uh, example of that is the. Uh, SL2, which we know is simply connected, and uh, so our root lattice in this situation, so it's, this space is one dimensional, and the root lattice, uh, right, so the root alpha sends this to t squared, so the root lattice is 2z, right, and uh, the, the, this pairing is just product, and so the weight lattice is um, just the integers, things that, uh, and uh, and it's exactly the character lattice of the torus, right? Because uh, you can send this element to t to the, any integer power, and you get a character. Okay. I hope I haven't screwed this up. I uh, do this calculation many times, and sometimes get wrong answers. So. Um, Okay, so now what does it all have to do with uh, with our Chevalier quotient? So, uh, well, it has to do the following thing. That, uh, so remember, uh, we discussed yesterday that uh, the, this Chevalier map is given by uh, elementary symmetric functions. I'll put them in quotes because, I mean, this is literally true only for SLN, but uh, there was this uh, W invariant generators of the ring of symmetric W invariant polynomials on, on, uh, on T. Uh, and so these elementary symmetric functions uh, can, be think, can, be, can be thought of as um, traces 
of uh, rational representations of our group. So uh, let me write this down properly. So uh, let mu i be, so here up to the rank again, because it's, uh, because the character lattice generates, uh, sorry, because the weight lattice and the character lattice are the same. So, so let this be a z basis Um, sorry, uh, ah. I'll say for, for the, sorry, I wanted for the weight lattice actually, sorry about that. And so, and then, okay, yeah, so I, I just want, so this is the fundamental weights. And so to each of these fundamental weights, uh, you have a, a test, a rational representation Um, of highest weight mu i. And so then the trace of this guy, so this is this is a finite dimensional thing, right? So we're talking rational representations, right? So it's just like think representations of a uh, Lie algebra. You know? So uh, uh, maybe, okay, a, a timely example. So if you think of SL2, right? So then uh, you only have mu one, right? This, you only have one fundamental weight and it's one. Uh, living here, so this is one, it's oh, mu one, so this, this is my x star tensor r. This is the one-dimensional space, and this is zero. Um, and uh, so the uh, uh, rational representation, so rho one is the standard representation, is the representation with highest weight one, right? Just the standard representation. Uh, So it's on um, on a two-dimensional space over F. This is just writing down SL2, and uh, and so then, um, well, uh, it happens in this situation that. <laughs> And so, so uh, the representations, irreducible represent, rationally reducible representations are classified by integers, and they happen to be so representation of highest weight n actually is the n symmetric power of rho one, and this in fact generalizes to SLN as well. So uh, the representations. You can choose the uh, fundamental weights such that the representations corresponding to with, with highest weight mu i for a system of fundamental weights are symmetric <laughs> i's power of the standard representation. And so then the traces of these symmetric powers are of course exactly the elementary symmetric polynomials. So coming back to this, the only meaningful one for GL2 the group here, uh, is, sorry, for SL2 the group, we're talking about a semi-simple group. So it's going to be the trace, just the trace of the standard representation. This is the good old trace. So it's back to the same. And so the point is the following. So uh, what we're looking at is that we get these elementary symmetric polynomials that we wanted in order to construct the map. We get them out of the representations that are given to us by the weight lattice, right? Notice that for now, the character lattice of the torus has not shown up there. So we want them to generate the whole algebra of polynomials of W invariant polynomials on T, right? So, uh, so of course we're going to get that if if these guys from the beginning spanned the character lattice of the torus, then we're in good shape. And so. Thank you. 
So when mu i span exactly span, I mean over z. So that's exactly the simply connected case. <coughs> Then we get the full uh, polynomial algebra. Mm. And, and, then, and then everything works out. And so what we get, finally, the upshot is this, that if G is semi-simple, simply connected, then we get a map from G, um, to this T split mod W defined over F. And it's still basically the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial if you're thinking of a classical group. So officially speaking, G maps to these traces over O i of G, where these are these rational representations with, uh, whose highest weights are the fundamental weights. And it's still thinking of the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. Now, one kind of thing that I don't want to put on the board, I'll say it kind of quickly, so I was initially confused by this a little bit. So normally one thinks that, oh, you know, of course, I mean, if you have a, some construction for the V algebra, it should work for the semi-simple group, right? Just because we're used to lifting maps. So just, just be careful here because, uh, I mean, uh, so, and yeah, so we call this the Steinberg map, actually. Or maybe some people call it Chevalier Steinberg mm -hmm. map, I'm not so sure. So basically it's the Chevalier map for the Lie algebra and the Steinberg map for the group. But notice that, uh, say, for SL2, yeah, maybe I'll make a small note of this. For SL2, the, and, and it's also denoted by C in Frankel, Langlands, and Go, so I'll, I'll keep that. But anyway, so uh, the Chevalier map on the Lie algebra is determinant, right? Because the trace is doing nothing. And on the group, the Steinberg map on the group, it is actually trace. So, uh, I mean, the map on the Lie algebra is not the differential as you would think of the map on the group, right? So it's just, so this is something else that happens. That's why I kind of went into this explanation. It's, uh... So now the point of this is the following. So, uh, yeah, so when, uh, so what happens when G is not so when G is reductive and G derived simply connected, okay, so then there is another little trap into which you can fall. So what, uh, what FLN do, um, sorry, I abbreviate them because it's kind of hard to pronounce and they probably mispronounce almost everybody anyway. So, uh, okay, so what they do is, um, so they actually, uh, well, I mean, that's what you would naturally want to do, right? So you have the center times G derived, and it maps to G. Uh, no, this is not what I want to say. Uh, sorry. Um, before I say something else, that's completely ridiculous. No, the other way around. Sorry, I, I was expecting this. This was not going to work. So, sorry about that. Right, so, so this, is, this is a finite group. Uh, well, so this A is uh, the center intersected with G derived. So in our examples with GLN, this is gonna be a finite group, something like the group of roots of unity, right? <clears throat> and, uh, okay, so what you can do, so you, you kind of want a map from G to the space AG. What you have is you, you have the space A G derived, and you can just map the center. The center is, we're assuming everything is split, right? So the center is just a split torus. It's just a bunch of copies of GM, really usually one copy of GM in all cases we're looking at. So, uh, and that sits as an open subset in some affine space. So you could just do this. So, um, so this map here is fine. So it's identity on the center. Um, So this is an intersection with G derived. And okay, so this, this map is doing fine. And so the point is that 
actually, you don't maybe maybe you don't even have to describe the map from G down there. So there is always this this matter. It's, it's like you almost get a map from G to this space, right? And maybe you don't care. Maybe you just care to say that stable orbits in G are going to be parameterized by pairs of an element of the center and an element of G derived, and you'll be okay with that. And so as they define the measures on stable orbits, that's how they proceed. And uh, so that's that's kind of the picture we will have in mind. We will just say, okay, so for GL, so for GL N, for example, this would mean that we're going to represent Non uniquely, but basically we don't care. Uh, we're going to represent an element of GLN as a central element times. Uh, so for for defining measures and orbits, and that's something that I will talk about in a moment. We can write gamma, at this point I'm going to switch to GLN, but I mean, uh, just, just for illustration, you can think about it as G, as uh, gamma is gamma prime times Z, where uh, gamma prime is in G derived and Z is in the center. And you basically, so it doesn't matter that, well, it sort of does for some factors, but you know, for the purposes of definition, it doesn't matter much that it's not unique. So you can kind of deal with this non-uniqueness later, and it's not a big deal. On the other hand, if you're doing something natural, so uh, that's why I'm saying it's a bit of a trap into which I kind of fell for a while. Uh, so <clears throat> if you are used to this writing down the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, so for a classical group, for example, GLN, or GSP, or something, so you, you still have coefficients G maps to things like coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. And it lands in the same, in a space that's isomorphic to this. It's, right, because uh, now, so suppose it's for GLN, right, so we have um, all these uh, coefficients. The last coefficient is the determinant. For GSP, you could use the determinant, you could use the multiplier, so, but you get something. And you know, it's just non-zero, so that's exactly living in this GM copy there, and there is no problem, and you don't notice that you're about to have a problem. Um, and uh, that's, I think, a perfectly reasonable map. You could use it for all kinds of things, but just be aware that later when we define measures, so this map and that map are not the same. Right, because uh, <laughs> yeah, they're just slightly different map, and so uh, the when you compute the Jacobian of the transformation of measures using this map versus that map would give you different answers. So just be aware of which map you're using. So I mean, I don't see any problem with this. It seems to work, and gives slightly different measures. Okay, and later, but we'll, we'll talk about measures in a moment. Okay, questions? Okay, so now at this point, so uh, just to summarize, so we've got our Steinberg kitchen base, so the only case that I have any ambition to discuss is the case when G derived is simply connected, so, so for G reductive and split, with G derived simply connected. We have this Steinberg kitchen base, so at least we got the first part of what I promised to do. So they have this fancy A and the fancy B, so I think, so this, the, <laughs> So this one is the Mathrac capital A in their paper, and this is the B. I mean, I'm unable to do the A, sorry, on the board. So this is, this is if, if you're looking at their paper, that's, that's the notation. I will just keep my AG derived in Z just to keep it clean. And so basically, this whole thing is almost an affine space, right? So you know, if, if you forget about the Z, it is an affine space. Z sits as an open subset in an affine space, so everything is great. So that's what they promised to do, and here we are. And yeah, and so the point here is that when you don't have this condition, right, when G-derived is not simply connected, then um, 
this doesn't really work, right? And so then the then the the space will wind up being a kind of quotient of an affine space by that uh, finite quotient that you get by of, of the weight lattice mod t, and then so it, it might even be singular. I don't really know what would look like. Okay. So all right. Great. So now, finally, on to measures. So, so the next kind of heading is measures on orbits. So uh, remember, uh, so the orbital integral is, this has been written many times here, I'm sure, so it's f of g inverse gamma g dg dt. Okay, so I think for the rest of today, I am going to focus on what do these two measures actually mean? What do we mean by this? How do we define this measure? By the way, I write an orbit, uh, orbital integral, I mean stable orbital integral is a finite sum, right? So, well, remember the picture that used to be on this board. <coughs> Rational orbits, um, yeah, maybe I make a quick note about this. Sorry? Oh yeah, t is uh, t gamma, the centralizer of gamma. Oh yeah, so I guess, I mean, I am here obviously assuming that gamma is regular semi-simple. Okay, and yeah, then since I'm already assuming that you derived is simply connected and the centralizers are connected, so they, they will be touring. Okay, so uh, now a quick note here is that, uh, so any stable orbit, um, is a finite union of rational orbits. And so giving a measure on a stable orbit is equivalent to giving a measure on the rational orbits, right? Because they are open in the stable orbit. And so if I have a measure somehow, so I can, I might as well define it either on each rational orbit, because for uh, elements that are stably conjugate, the centralizer is the same. So it really doesn't matter. Like to, when I want to just talk about measure definitions, it really doesn't matter whether I'm talking about stable orbit or uh, rational orbits. So just so that there's no confusion. Okay. And so, yeah, everything is local at the moment. Yeah, so it, that's important. So uh, for now, everything is happening locally. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so what do we mean? So, and so there are two reasonable approaches to, uh, well, so uh, let's talk about this. So the approach to measures in, in the trace formula <coughs> is, uh, well, so uh, there are fin finitely many <laughs> conjugacy classes of tori, you can just pick a measure dt uh, on a representative of each conjugacy class. I'll talk more about it later, like what are the reasonable measures to pick. And when I say pick, it really, again, uh, all our measures are unique up to constants, right? So, but these constants sort of matter when you uh, put it all together. And so, uh, so here, pick a normalization. We'll talk very carefully about how to pick these normalizations in a moment. And so then, so basically at this point, you've made finitely many choices. And that gives you a consistent way to normalize all of these measures, right? And then, and then use quotient measures. Uh, that somehow choose the DG and, and, and you're done. And uh, now, how to, in general, so how to uh, pick a Haar measure on a group? So I think that there are two natural ways. And they don't, they're both natural in some sense for different questions and they're not the same. Uh, one is to start with an invariant differential form. I will in a moment talk in detail about how we associate measures with differential forms. But basically, if you have an invariant differential form, um, it should give you a measure and you get the measure. 
another, is to say, okay, there exists higher measure, unique up to a constant, I'm just going to choose a constant so that, you know, I'm just going to choose a normalization. So another way is to pick a compact subgroup in your group and pin down its volume. And we'll see in a moment that a lot of arithmetic information, well, in a moment, meaning like within the next two lectures, uh, nah, might spill into, into January 2nd, uh, that uh, a lot of arithmetic information is hiding between the conversion from here to there. And so, okay. So now, uh, so DG is kind of the easiest thing to do because in a way, I mean, you write down the trace formula. If you rescale the Haar measure on G, nothing much happens. You can kind of see how to rescale both sides and uh, you can pick something. So it's, uh, it's less of a pain to deal with the renormalization of DG than with the renormalization of DT. But in any case, and also G is split, it's easier to, to start thinking about G. So, uh, but so, but before we choose a measure on G, let's generally talk about uh, what choices we're making at all and how we normalize anything. So, uh, so you start from the very beginning, and, and you have to pin down a normalization of a measure, which you will call dx on the affine line. Right, so it's kind of like in the Lebesgue measure analogy, uh, if you have a coordinate, uh, uh, well, I mean, if you have a line, you have to decide where one is, and then you say that the unit interval has length one. So somewhere there you have to make some choice. And my hope is that we'll make one choice, and from here everything else will be canonical. But this is really a, a bona fide choice to make. And so, again, there are unfortunately two choices that are reasonable. Uh, and I made a different one from FLN. So uh, for these lectures, I will stick with my choice. So, I mean, a reasonable choice is, one reasonable choice is um, to uh, just say that the ring of integers, so remember, at the moment, we, we're dealing with a local field here. And of course, this is, you know, I spent all my life working with local fields, so for me, this is the reasonable choice. Uh, for FLN, a different choice is a reasonable choice, so I'll, I'll say that in a moment. So, uh, so if you have a local field, you can just say that the, the, you want the uh, ring of integers. I'll, I'll write volume all the time. So volume of the ring of integers is one. Sounds reasonable, no? <laughs> Somewhere there. So I take a compact subgroup and I'm just going to normalize it to have volume one. I'm just on the line. Uh, okay. Now, the second choice, and this is the FLN choice, which is, uh, uh, I think, much more motivated by global considerations, is you start, so you fix a character. Uh, so I don't know how to say this. So our F, let F be some, this is terrible. I'm sorry. So, so this K is bad. I don't know what to do. So L, uh, okay. L, V, L is some global field. So remember, basically, everything, I am talking about a local picture, and some things will soon become unimportant. But when everything comes from a global field, <clears throat> then, uh, uh, so you fix a character of the global field. And then you want, um, And you, you want to n normalize all um, local measures, uh, which you will call dx on the affine line, uh, so that uh, Fourier inversion holds. where, uh, you know, the character gives you a Fourier transform on the line. We're just talking on the line, right? And so you, c you can normalize this to have self-dual measures. <clears throat> so this would give you something like, so uh, notice that this fellow is not self-dual with respect to a reasonable, like again, you pick a reasonable character. Of course, then everything starts depending on the conductor of the character, but uh, pick a reasonable character, say trivial on uh, uh, the ring of integers non-trivial on uh, p inverse times the ring of integers, right? So then this and that is different by square root of p locally. 
So this one is not so, so these are different. But the good news is that you can sort of track how the difference between these two measures propagates. Because it's so basic, right? It's just a way to choose a measure on the affine line. So if one of them is, say, square root of p times another, then for an n-dimensional manifold, you will always have this square root of p to the n that shows up in the front. And just because I'm unable to keep track of all these square roots all the time and I have some other square roots popping up, I am going to actually stick with this. I'm sorry. At least it's rational when you're working with a local field. Okay, so now that I have chosen a measure on the affine line, uh, yeah, by the way, I should have said, so, uh, I mean, this is a better choice in a sense because it's more canonical. So I think we had this conversation on the bus. So, I mean, you fix a character, you have to choose something. But then, then that imposes a measure on this canonical. This, even though it looks like the ring of integers is a very natural compact subgroup of an affine line, I mean, it's not a canonical compact subgroup. Oh, you will pick up a P, I think. So if, if your character is uh, level one, then when you do Fourier inversion, I think you pick up P or one over p, I don't remember which way. But. And so you have to redistribute it. So you have to, like if you rescale, if you scale the measure by one over root p, then uh, it becomes self-dual. Uh, self I should put this in the notes. By the way, I am writing the notes. I'm sorry I'm late on that, but I am trying to put all these details and some lots of examples into the notes. And hopefully, I mean, by the end of this, we'll be optimistic, but hopefully within a couple of weeks uh, of returning to Vancouver, I'll, I'll send the notes to the organizers. Uh, just, of course, as usual, things over overflow. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, so I'm saying that if, if the character is like the reasonable character you would expect, then... Uh, but not at all places, right? So you cannot make it work at all places. <laughs> yeah, I, I will put that in the notes. I mean, this, this is the difference that's easy to track, sort of, so I'll put that down. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, all right, so now, uh, but I'm still, I'm going to continue working locally, and so this is going to be my choice for now. Um, and so then, uh, so the whole thing was introduced by Vey uh, in his book, Adele's and Algebraic Groups. So once you've normalized the measure on the affine line, then you don't have any choices anymore. So then any differential form, any volume form, by volume form I mean top degree differential form, non-vanishing, if it exists. Form omega gives a measure which I will denote by d omega v uh, at every place, if you're thinking globally. <clears throat> so if, it, if the form is just defined over your local field, then it just gives you. And, and that's, that's uh, just the way you would do in calculus. You know, you take an uh, open set, you integrate the, uh, uh, the volume form, or you take the absolute, uh, so you know, OK, maybe write it this way. So omega locally in local coordinates is some f of x1 xd, where d is the dimension of the thing you're integrating on dx1, dxd, and so the, the, the measure then is an integral of absolute value of f with respect to this measure. And so this is now, so you know, since you're working with local coordinates, you, so on, on each chart you're working with a subset of an affine space, and uh, on the affine space by now the measure has been normalized because we have normalized the measure of what each of these d-axes does. So this is completely pinned down. And of course, uh, being a differential form tells you that you get the right Jacobian rule when you switch between charts, so everything works out, and that's laid out by me. <laughs> By the way, it's kind of interesting. So when you read FLN, uh, they sort of say that, oh, you know, it's very important for what we're doing to understand the normalization of Haar measures, but it's not written down anywhere, even in the most quoted references. So I kind of, uh, yeah, I second that. Uh, and so then they go into a very long explanation of what happens with the measures, and I'm just trying to make sense of it somehow. OK, so now the, the point, uh, which is uh, somehow also very important in Vey, is the following. that. 
So suppose you have a, a scheme <coughs> defined over the ring of integers of your local field. So again, so f f is again local, uh, which is smooth. So meaning the special fiber is also smooth. Um, so then. And so just making lots of assumptions. So suppose, and suppose you have a omega, which is a gauge form, a volume form on X. So then it turns out that such a thing is actually kind of unique up to a unit, right? Because it has to be non-vanishing on the special fiber as well. And uh, that means that if you want to rescale it, you'll have to rescale it by a unit. And of course, the space, the, it's, the space of such forms is one dimensional anyway. And so then, uh, at this point, the integral over the OF points of X of this volume form is, uh, is well defined. So this is the absolute value of F. So this is, this is at this point, a canonical thing. And if you compute this volume, so it turns out that it equals the number of points on the special fiber of X over Q to the dimension of X. So, uh, so this is the residue field. So, well, FQ is the residue field. Uh, X cup is the special fiber. I'll, I will do examples of this in a moment. But I would like to kind of emphasize the fascinating thing here, that this seems to be a completely analytically defined thing, right? That you take uh, a volume form, you integrate, and it looks like you're doing analysis. Here, it's obvious that you're doing arithmetic, you're counting points. So just a very quick interlude on uh, why this actually is a very natural formula. So, and this, this only works, of course. So a very important note here is that this uses m this normalization. So if you look at FLN, there, there is some square root of some norm of the different factor. And that's, that's because uh, they're using that normalization. So uh, yeah, so why this is working? So, the first obvious observation is that with this normalization, it works for the affine line, right? Because uh, the number of points of the affine line over a finite field divided by Q to the dimension of the affine line is precisely one, which is exactly the volume of the ring of integers. Equally well, it works on an affine space. Then, you know, just raise it to the dimension D. And so, Now, and now, okay, so a little bit of a leap of faith. Uh, sorry, it's unfortunate they have to change boards for in the middle of the calculation. So, uh, so now basically we're saying that x is smooth over the ring of integers basically is roughly speaking equivalent to saying that if you look at the reduction mod P map, so it's supposed to be mod the uniformizer. So reduction mod P map on X looks in local coordinates as it does on the affine space of the corresponding dimension. What I'm trying to say is that if I take a coordinate chart, right, because it's smooth, it really, it's, the thing is a manifold, it looks like a piece of the affine space. If I do reduction mod P, it does the exact same thing as the reduction mod P on the affine space does. And what does it mean? It mean but for an affine space, the volume of the fiber over every point in the affine space over FQ, right? So over every point in the special fiber, you have a fiber of the reduction mod P map. It's like all these things who, that reduce to that point. So the volume of this fiber is uh, oops, Q 
to the minus d, minus the dimension of the affine space, right? It's, that's what we just observed in the affine line. The volume of PO was 1 over P. And uh, the same thing happens here up to the dth power. And so now what we're saying is the following thing. So we have our x of OF, so this is a very bad picture, but it's reducing down to, so this is reduction what the uniformizer map, right? So it's reducing down to some points. Um, so this is the special fiber. And over each point you have a fiber. And the volume of that fiber, uh, the differential form takes care that this volume is a pullback basically of the volume on the affine space and the local coordinates. And uh, uh, so then the volume should equal, the volume of each fiber equals um, Q to the minus D. And that's how you get that the volume of the whole space, which is after all a disjoint union of finitely many fibers, is the number of these fibers times the volume of each fiber. Yes? Right. Yeah, it is certainly Hansel's lemma. So that's what I'm saying. That the smoothness of X guarantees that uh, the map is surjective and each fiber by Hansel's lemma is that. Yeah, thanks. All right. And so, uh, yeah, and so we have this, this kind of calculation. So this would be handy to remember. And so, uh, well, when we're working with algebraic groups, lots of things are going to be smooth. Okay, so now we're ready to... Uh, define what dg is doing and uh, and compute the volume. Okay, so now we're finally we're kind of attacking this orbital integral here. So, all right. So our orbital integral, so the dg. Uh, so, well, uh, remember everything is going to eventually come from a global field, so we're just going to choose a differential form, an invariant differential form on G. So, well, in our example of G is GL2, it's my kind of running example, I'll choose omega to be this dg plus, which is just uh, the affine space measure on the matrix entries over the determinant squared. Um, and once you've chosen a differential form, then at every place uh, you, you get uh, an invariant measure. And so, well, what we just discussed, because g is smooth, is that the volume of g of the rank of integers of uh, every place is going to be the number of points of GL2 of FQ over Q to well, dimension of G, which is Q to the fourth. Oh yeah, so uh, actually another thing that is, uh, I, should have, I should have done these examples in, in a different order, sorry, the, the previous example, I should have done it first. So let's actually look at the Completely primitive example, right? The, the invariant differential form here is dx over x, right? And the volume of gm of the ring of integers is the number of units. So this is q minus 1 over q. So this will pop up all the time. And uh, oh, actually, this might be a natural place to stop. So OK, so what, what I'm going to do next time is talk about this dt, which turns out to be much more interesting because, uh, so g was split. The torus, on the other hand, it's a centralizer of an element, you know, if the element is elliptic, that's not gonna be split. And uh, the matter is, uh, by now, the, so the question is, what does it mean to take rational points of the torus, right? So it's, it's, it's a non-trivial question. Sorry, sorry, what does it mean to take integer points of the torus? It's defined over the field, but not over the ring of integers naturally. So you'll have to choose a model or do something. And so this would be a matter of discussion. And then next we will do a vial integration formula to convert to a different type of choosing measures which is related to the steinberg hitchin base. So that's gonna be next time. Thank you. <laughs> and next time is soon. <laughs>